So, Sean, take us through these this first round, at least, of sanctions. Right. Uh, it's a wide range of sort of disparate products and, and activities. Uh, how much pressure is this likely to bring to bear on the Iranian economy? Well, we're seeing pressure already, I think, hitting the Iran Iranian economy, and something we've been talking about a lot at Barclays, we hosted a, a big event on this the other day, is the administration's goal is to really bring them back to the table to get uh, a more comprehensive set of sanctions. They're talking about ballistics, issues on nuclear policy, as well as something we haven't seen before, thoughts on how to contain Iran's behavior in the region. So the administration's goal is to put as much economic pressure as they can right now. And, and President Trump has said he'd like to sit down with Mr. Rouhani right. and have a negotiation. He likes these one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano sorts of discussions. Mm -hmm. Is there any indications the Iranians are open to that? So far, I doubt it. Uh, it's possible that could change. You see some folks on the diplomatic side in the Iranian community talking about the need for this, while a lot of the hardliners and others have said, you know, there's no benefit to negotiating with the United States right now. They're likely to uh, renege on any sort of promises they make. And so, Michael, bring it to the oil market for us, um, because there has been this perception in the market that we're going to see a decrease in supply coming from Iran. Is that how it's going to play out? Yeah, I mean, eventually it will play out in that fashion. I mean, just for context, Iran produces about 4 million barrels a day, exports a little over 2. Um, in, the last, uh, in the last round of sanctions, we saw exports come off by about a million barrels a day. So I would say the more bullish expectations are that we could see anywhere from 1 to 1. 1.2 million barrels a day of, of exports cut off as a result of these sanctions, but probably not until we get closer to November 4th, which is when the next round of sanctions starts to uh, start to come into place. There's obviously a lot of questions about whether uh, these different counterparties will receive waivers for their exports for their imports of Iranian oil. That remains to be seen even after we convene this group of experts. It's not really clear to us um, necessarily which ones will receive a waiver and how that is calculated, whether they will, whether they will get this significant reduction exemption, which is what the State Department is using to determine whether you can be, uh, have a waiver for, for your imports. Just a quick side note, if it goes down by one or two million barrels, what happens to that oil? Does Iran cut back on its production to make up for that? Do they stockpile it somewhere? So Iran does have a, a very large stockpile of offshore capacity, and they have some capacity on, on land, anywhere from about 10 to 15 days. So it's not a lot onshore, but it is a significant amount offshore. And I think the important thing to keep in mind here, broadly speaking, is that there are other sinks. There are other offsets. So Saudi Arabia does have some spare capacity. Um, it can continue to, to raise its production levels. The other thing is, is that the market is dynamic. So if prices move higher, uh, then the U.S. pressure may not be as severe as if the prices stay lower. So that's the other really important takeaway from, from our seminar and from our thoughts and in, in our discussions is that this is yet another cook in the kitchen of trying to keep prices lower. Uh, Sean, President Trump has said he doesn't like multilateral trade deals. He likes bilateral. That may or may not work on trade. We don't quite know yet. When it comes to sanctions, mm -hmm. bilateral is not so effective because if you're not <laughs> shipping something to somebody and somebody else is, mm -hmm. then they get it anyway. Do we have any sense of, which, uh, of the extent to which these new sanctions coming into effect may be gone around by other countries, whether Europe or China or India? Absolutely. And I think China and India pose a huge problem for this. Um, from in the Indian side of this, you see a lot of Indian cooperation with Iran, thinking about oil purchases. And on the China side of this, is this as well, you realize they inked a large 10-year trade deal with Iran, talking about one belt road that goes all the way through Eurasia into Iran. And there's a lot of talk about how do you curtail Chinese operators from continuing to buy uh, Iranian crude oil. So what's the hope here that this will actually bring the Iranians to the table? I don't quite understand yeah. the theory. For, for President Trump and the administration, a lot of it is putting this pressure on Iran and then talking separately with the Chinese authorities, with Russians, as well as the Europeans that come on board with the sanctions, uh, the new sanctions policy for the new JCPOA. But we haven't seen this as very effective uh, in public yet, but obviously a lot is happening behind the scenes. As November 4th rolls uh, comes around, as Michael had mentioned, there's going to be continued pressure by the administration to get everybody on board for this. Um, in the meantime, while this is hanging over the oil market's head, and not to mention China and the U.S., if you take a look at the Bloomberg and hedge fund positions in oil, um, both long and short, total positions are in blue here, crude oil futures, both WTI and uh, Brent positions here in blue, and then crude oil futures in white, it seems like people are kind of holding back, right, because there is this uncertainty about which way it's going to go. Right. It sounds like, though, you guys have come to the conclusion it's not necessarily going to have 
a price boost effect well, necessarily. I think what it's, what's important to understand is that it is that the bias is skewed towards the upside. Clearly, there's a whole host of disruption uh, possibilities as we move into the end of the year. But we are in the summer right now. We're seeing you know demand signals that are not as great as they were at the beginning of the summer. We're seeing you know the broader market balance is not that conducive at this point in time to seeing prices rapidly go higher. Um, what I would just say is that when you look at you know U.S. production, it's also continuing to increase, and it will continue to increase next year. So the market balance is is not as tight as I think what many had expected as we moved into the summer, and that's causing this this uh, skepticism. And and then the other thing that's going on is the broader question about the macro economy. And when you look at um, the hedge fund positioning in not just in oil but in in other commodities, and you look at commodity price activity outside of oil, prices are moving down. And I think that's that's also part of what we're seeing this pressure from. Do you have a particular year-end target for oil prices? Yes, yeah, so our target is mid-70s. Um, we had forecasted when we were at all, all the way up to almost $80, we had forecasted to move down to the low 70s. We're here. We think that prices will move slightly higher in the next quarter, but basically stay range-bound. And as I mentioned, the Iran sanctions issue is yet another thing where the U.S. government can play a role in price formation along with the Saudis, along with OPEC. Well, and to that point, Sean, President Trump has another uh, agenda item here, which is the midterm elections. <laughs> he doesn't want gasoline prices to get too high. He might want to right. put pressure on the Iranians, but he doesn't want that price to get too high. Absolutely. This, this, the, the way the current polling looks right now, I think anybody's baseline on polling would show that Democrats have a clear advantage in the House. You know, they can flip the necessary number of seats. Obviously, on the Senate side, it's a much tougher. But for President Trump, looking at this, he obviously doesn't want to give control to the Democrats in the House. He'll give them subpoena powers and a lot of other uh, investigative powers. And all. And the roadmap he has for a 2020 re-election could face a lot of obstacles if the Democrats control the House.